でもないすぐに乗りこなすから黙って見ていなさい私は負けない私は世界で一番強いマスターなんだから Ilya's role in Unlimited Blade Works is marginally less than its predecessor, The Fate Route. As a matter of fact, the anime adaptation by Ufotable added scenes of her that weren't in the visual novel. While the actual quality of said scenes is a matter for another day, her screen time, while short, comes in the form of one of the most impactful scenes in Fate, and sheds some much needed light on the ten years she spent at the Winter Castle between Zero and Stay Night. In case you didn't see the first part where I explored Ilya in the Fate Route, this video will spoil large parts of the visual novel, its adaptations, and Ilya's minor role in Fate Zero. While you don't necessarily have to have watched that video to understand this one, I'd greatly appreciate it if you checked it out, as it will provide a better understanding of some of the things brought up here. Moving forward from the Fate Route, a question soon comes to mind. If Ilya isn't the typical Emoto as portrayed previously, who is she at her core? To find that answer, the journey begins on a very familiar looking road, with the snowy princess alongside the bestial giant, ready to attain revenge ten years in the making. Like in the Fate Route, she politely greets the pair of masters and then sends Berserker out to attack in an overly joyful manner. Her attitude is short and to the point, emphasizing the need to end the Grail War quickly and attain or kill Shiro. Either would work for her at this point. Her ever brutalistic mindset in mind, the battle would be the same as before, but now archers around to mix things up. When his hellish arrow hits Berserker, Ilya is shown not to just be ignorant in situations where she's on top. She acknowledges his power and even congratulates Ren on her servant in a sincere manner. Unlike the Berserker fight in the forest during the last route where she was rash, here Ilya is calmly thinking through the situation. Though at the same time, she is naturally more than a little excited about achieving her goals. However, that isn't what this battle is about anymore to her. Now that she's tested out the two, in her mind, strongest contenders, she knows two things. That she wants Archer, who's the more powerful servant, and that she still wants revenge. She could keep this fight going, but why spoil the fun? As shown in the UBW anime only scene, she likely did this to mentally mess with the two masters and to prolong the sweet taste that has been ruined by Shiro almost dying in this route. His not getting his organs all over the ground is, oddly enough, vital to her mindset towards revenge and the Grail War as a whole. While their next meeting in the Fate Route was done out of a whim and genuine wanting to get to know her sort of brother after his death wasn't rewarding at all, in UBW, no such death occurs. So she continues with that malicious mindset of revenge, never once setting foot out of her castle to meet her Onichan. From this point on in UBW, Ilya proceeds to have no mentions or goings on until day 8, where Liz is out buying ingredients for a cake. While it would be fun to see a brief scene of levity from her in this route where she bakes, no such calm before the storm is given, and the next time Ilya's seen is around the midpoint of the route, when Ren and Shiro, now servantless, try and ally with her. Despite her being very aggressive when they first met, they doubt Ilya would turn them down, especially being who they are. She puts on a front, but Shiro has it right when he says Ilya is not a downright evil person. Had this route played out differently, I think she would have sincerely agreed and helped. She's shown to want people to talk to, and with Shiro and Ren begging for her aid, she no doubt accept the offer after some negotiation. While the inherent nature of the situation would have been different due to the more dire circumstances, it's possible that such an act could have opened up a path for an eventual bond that was their post-berserker in the Fate Route. During the night before the two head to the Einsburn Castle, Shiro ponders about the next day and their plans to talk with Ilya. Despite not having much bonding time in this route, Shiro still thinks of her in a positive manner and doesn't have any uneasiness when thinking about the prospect of seeing her, viewing her as a proper girl despite the voice of Archer telling him not to believe in such a fantasy when they've never even spoken. But, rather it be his inherent protective nature, his brotherly instincts, or just fulfilling his ideals to the fullest, Emiya Shiro will hold out hope for Ilya's feel. As a side note, I'm never ready for this next scene. Upon arrival at the edge of the forest, Shiro makes a mental note that it seems intimidating. Similar to how Ilya looks around Berserker, if we look at it from the lens of the elegant castle being Ilya and the forest protecting it being Berserker, an interesting piece of symbolism can be seen. 
as the castle is described many times as being vast and elegant, yet at the same time empty, waiting for people to keep it company and fill the emptiness. As well, the barrier around the area serves the distinct purpose of showing her outward persona that she puts on. When said barrier shocks Ren, she yells at the sky for Ilya laughing at her. That carefree rivalry with others was the epitome of her personality in the Fate Route. She's dangerous, but also open to accepting the two in. Upon getting into the castle, something is immediately apparent. They aren't the only visitors. Hearing the sounds of war, a battle between Gilgamesh and Berserker, Shiro starts to get riled up and those protective instincts come into play. When it comes to Ilya, regardless of route, Shiro's protective instincts will come into full effect. Once they approach the room and see the battle before them, the things of note are the two already watching. Shinji, as smug as ever, and Ilya, who's shivering, almost in tears at the prospect of losing her servant, who in this route has been her only real friend. As seen in a flashback, Ilya has a special bond with Berserker. Once he's gone, she will have been robbed of an important protective figure in her life twice. While she's fearing for her life, she likely fears a lot more for that inevitability. So, she chokes back tears watching this all unfold. She wants someone to help her out of this. Despite all she's lost, she's still holding out hope. This creates the illusion for the audience that Shiro is going to save her, but he can't. Rin stops him from throwing his life away. Ilya is at her lowest here, and so we see her as she is on the inside. A weak girl still looking for someone to save her. For her father to come home. Don't get me wrong, she has strength and resolve plenty now, but the truth is that it's all just a face to get people close to her, to like her strength. She hasn't had emotional guidance since age 8, so for 10 years she's had to figure this all out herself, and for that she's done an amazing job. Just look at the fate route where she did make those connections with others and begin to develop emotionally. Her facade no longer a way to just attract people to her, but something she can wear with some semblance of pride as her real feelings and personality come to the forefront. But that's the fate route, and here in UBW things are different. The bond between Berserker and Ilya means he will do anything to protect the girl. He fights a losing battle knowing that's the only way to prolong his master's short life. As simplistic as his mentality is, that's the one thing he knows above all. As the battle comes to the end and he's bound by the heavens chain, Ilya tries to call Berserker back. This is a battle that can't be won, so she at least wants to save someone while she's here. Something that was never done for her, yet she still wants to protect him. Similarly to how Shira wanted to protect Saber in the last route, she may not be able to do anything on her own, but his life is more important than her own right now. However, command spells won't do anything to change the situation, and Gilgamesh kills Berserker's last life in the next instant. Ilya has lost herself at the death of Berserker. She now feels truly alone in this world, and at her lowest, Gilgamesh mercilessly slashes her eyes out and stabs her. Berserker defies the laws of a servant and breaks the chains to protect Ilya, but is killed once more on the spot. Both are lost at this point. Shiro can't stop himself from doing something about this, so he recklessly puts his own life behind others like Ilya did just moments ago. And then, cut to black. In intermission plays, Winter Forest, denoting the history of Ilya and Berserker. The Einsburn Castle in her homeland is described as a place with a gray sky where it is always winter, and the air is cold and stagnant. Not the most pleasant sounding place, but there was once, when it wasn't so bleak, a happy family. The place that had been desolate for a thousand years was shown in a happy light back then, something to the bleak contrast of this interlude. What little warmth there was left in the castle vanished with the fourth war, and because of this, Ilya hates the cold. And that's what the Einsburn Castle is described as, a frozen place with only living corpses for company. The treatment Ilya went through for this Grail War was all done by people who have long since lost their humanity. Humanity that Ilya would have lost had she not been exposed to such emotion all those years ago. Her relationship with Berserker is shown to be one of literal master and servant at first. 
Despite her wanting to let others in, her attitude towards Berserker is telling of what years of isolation and torture at the Einsburn Castle did to her. The Einsburn have been shown through each Grail War to be desperate to attain the origin, and each one cheating in some way to attain that ever-elusive treasure. Ilya to them is just another product of this search, just another tool to guarantee success regardless of the methods used. She had a command spell engraved on her entire body, each move from Berserker causing her immense pain, likely shortening her already dwindling lifespan. Ignoring any complaints she may have had, the Einsburn threw her into the forest with the wolves and rejected homunculi. The only way for her to survive was to use the servant who drained so much from her. He protected her, but she scorned his very existence. Naturally because he caused her pain, but also because he reminded her of everything that she hated. She wouldn't have to be with him if the Grail War ten years ago was won. She wouldn't be in pain, she wouldn't have to confront the reality that no matter what she does, there's no way out of this. She constantly insulted him to hide her broken sense of self from herself. If he's below her, then at least she's not weak anymore. She wants someone she can reach out to, but how to channel those feelings into something positive eludes her. She knows the inevitability of a short life, but just wants to avoid thinking about it, just like hiding away a painful memory. She uses tactics to ignore it and build upon that image of herself that she has in her head, the image of someone who's not weak and can achieve anything. Berserker recognizes this to an extent, however, and slowly but surely, through the torturous training, they begin to form an unbreakable bond, until Ilya begins to praise him and accept him as a part of her, as a source of warmth she can look to in the grueling winter of her life. To her, his strength will protect her from everything. In her last moments, she reaches out, hoping to find that warmth one last time to find that love which she never had much of in life. She looked to him as a fatherly figure and longed for him to hold her in his arms at times. Berserker, despite being a berserker, feels those emotions more than anything. So, in both of their last moments, they manage to reach out for each other. When they finally meet, Ilya falls asleep after saying she has nothing to fear if he's still around. After all, that strength will protect her from anything. The scene's placement in UBW may seem like a cheap way to establish an emotional throughline for the viewer to feel sad about Ilya's death, but when looking at the greater narrative as a whole, it serves an invaluable purpose. Showing the weaker side of Ilya that was hinted at in the Fate Route serves to humanize her character past those Emoto tropes she can so often fall into. It sets the basis for her jovial personality underneath the rough exterior. Expressing those emotions in an overly dramatic fashion is fun to her. Even if it's seen as a bit odd, what does she have left to lose? Regardless of how the reader or viewer feels about her overall, there's a real character underneath that goes vastly underappreciated. The next route, Heavensfeel, explores more of the real Ilya we see in UBW. Not an Ilya who's an innocent little girl, nor an Ilya who's seen as sad and weak, but as a fully realized individual who combines all the elements put forth thus far to create one of the best written characters in fiction. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this. If you did, a video on her role in Heaven's Feel, as well as the core of Ilya's Feel, should be coming out next week, if everything goes to plan. If you have any thoughts or comments on her inclusion in this route, or the video in general, I would absolutely love to hear them, as this one really hits home for me. With all that said, my name is Sleepycrest, and I hope you have a wonderful night.